um, and I recognize that it's it's very similar to what I do in my my current job. So I've got a team of scouts. Um, I've got a lot of football data and the question I'm always asked by people is how is it a data-led process or is it a person-led process? And my answer is always it's both because we start from a list of data and we filter that through the people and then you've ended up with that blend. Um, I think there's a, a lot of what we've done since I've joined is is teaching people how to conduct a meeting um, and recognizing that these are these are weird, slightly formal, very formal meetings where um, there's a lot of kind of telling people, wait, stop, listen, let's talk about this one, let's talk about this one. So, so essentially what, what we do is we start from a list that's already ranked by some measure that we've already got um, because that's, there's then less changing to do than if you started from, say, an alphabetical list. If you started from an alphabetical list, it would be absolute shuffling um, and then it looks like an impossible task. Whereas if you start from something then you're already in that mindset of, of fine tuning um so we start from that then we distribute that so people have a chance to discuss it like you said uh, people have a chance to go through it on their own um, and come up with their own opinion of what what should change um and then we have a meeting and obviously that'll be online but then i've i've always found that online works better for this kind of meeting anyway because you can spread out your paperwork you can have you know, yeah, uh, Zoom or Teams on on a phone or a tablet. You can have your laptop with all your data open. Um, I've just found it it works better for that anyway. Um, and then whoever's leading the meeting needs to go through every single name. Um, and I think that's really important for for the equality and the fairness. Like you said, I think if you just open up and say, right, these are the nines. Is everyone happy? There's going to be quiet kids that get forgotten about that people have people have missed out. Um, if you just want to talk about who needs to go up, who needs to go down, then you start getting into kind of situations of it's about the loudest kid and about the loudest member of staff. So I think it's, you go through every single play, every single name. Naturally, there's going to then be comparisons between names. And I think it's, it's kind of, you'll recognize that if you want to say this person's better than this person at, at physics or at maths or at art or whatever you're doing, those discussions are going to happen and that's fine but then don't go, oh, well, that person's a bit like that person or that person sits next to this person and then start jumping about the list. Try and keep that focus on. We're going to go through the list top to bottom. Everyone's going to get their turn. Everyone's going to get a fair share. Um, and then making sure that, that there's not politicking before and after. Um, I think you want to try and make sure that the process happens in a visible way um, so that everyone knows what's going on everyone's got that ownership um and then by going through person by person shuffling people up and down you end up with the list um i think i'd then go through again later on once the list's been checked um i think i'm generally a big believer that if you can do it once stop sleep on it look at it again with fresh eyes in the morning i think you come to a better decision than if you have to do it all in one big shot. If you block out right next Friday, the science department are all going to be off timetable. They're not doing any lessons. They're not doing, not coming into school. They're all going to do this for six, six or seven hours. Then people are going to burn out. And by the time you got to the bottom half of the list, people are just going to be going, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. So I think chunking it up, doing it in sections, stopping going back. I think all that stuff's really useful. Um, try and use the time you've got to arrive at, a sensible list um but i think it is also important to recognize that you cannot get any ranked list perfect it's not it's not possible to get 180 360 however big your cohort is unless you've got six kids you're not going to be able to get them in the perfect order you'd never have been able to predict the order they came out with you might have been able to predict 80 percent of the grades or 90 percent of the grades but you'd never have been able to pick 90% of the UMSs or 90% of the raw marks. You'd never have been able to do that. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that there's a random element in the exam period. And some of that comes from the kids. They might've had a bad night's sleep. Some of them will have done a lot of revision. Some of them won't. There's that element that you can't know as a teacher, but just the nature of assessment. Um, some papers are, so like on maybe on one extreme, 
a maths paper, they tend to look very similar year to year and the marking is fairly very accurate. Whereas a science paper, the papers vary more in terms of what content comes up or how big a question is some years to others and the marking is slightly more erratic. But then on the essay-based subjects the or the creative subjects, the questions are random and the marking is very erratic. So we have to acknowledge that there is always a random element you cannot get it perfect and you don't need to get it perfect because you can't the best that you just have to do the best you can do. Um, and I think as long as everyone keeps that in mind as that is the aim, the aim is to get the kids a fair, accurate set of results so that these results that they have, have credibility. Um, if word get, if, if a school puts their results in and then they tell their te- the kids what they're going to get, and they've all been bumped down a grade or two, then those kids don't feel they've earned what they've got. And I think if that happens nationally, then this cohort of kids have got a set of results that are going to be ignored forever. Whereas if we can get these kids, like, like we said, an accurate set of results that don't get massively kicked about, that gives it credibility. And as long as they get a set of results that open doors to the correct destination, that's got to be the main focus at this point, hasn't it, is getting the kids that should do an A-level in that subject, in your subject, if they should go and do an A-level in it, they should get a grade that lets them do that. If they should have to reset maths because their maths is going to hold them back in life, then that's what their grade should make them do and everywhere in between. And I think as long as we can, I'm not saying it doesn't matter if a kid gets a seven or an eight, but almost try and let go of that and just look at the bigger picture of, getting the cohort in the right order and an element of what will be will be. Um, I think that's probably a healthy way to approach it. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm sure there'll be some questions for you. Just a reminder, if you go onto the, the, the chat uh, the chat button, uh, which you can find there, hopefully, um, you've all found it at the bottom of your screens or the side of your screens, uh, do please uh, post any questions either from yourself, Chris, um, or Dylan. Um, and we will be able to get back to those. Um, Dylan, if you've got anything to add to that, one thing that I think people will be interested in is the idea that, um, of course, this this list is not going to be perfect. It's not going to be uh, completely accurate or, or, or reliable. Um, and yet, you know, these are students' results that depend on it. Have you got any thoughts about that, Dylan? Well, first, I'm going to assume that the people participating in this um, webinar are the people who are going to have some kind of responsibility for this in their schools. And therefore, I'm, I'm going to use some technical language, which I think will be helpful. Um, so I, I think, first of all, the, the point that Chris made, and I think um, I would, I, you know, I, I would emphasize that even more. The fact is that the GCSE grades that kids get are not the grades they deserve. We have a thing called a GCSE syllabus, and every kid has, you know, uh, as Chris says, kids have good days, they have bad days. One year, the paper might suit them, particularly in history, we have a smaller number of questions. The next year, this qu- the paper might not suit them as well. So what we're trying to predict is what each kid would get over the long term for a number of retakings, not just of the same GCSE paper, but of mm-hmm. all the GCSE papers that have ever been set on that particular curriculum. So I think... The, the thing to remember is that not only can no l- list be perfectly accurate, it doesn't even mean anything because accuracy um, is, is irrelevant when you're talking about the fact that the thing you're comparing it with is not accurate either. So I think there are two big ideas in assessment theory that might be helpful in terms of clarifying people's thinking. And they have horrendously complicated names, but I think it's worth understanding them. The most important in terms of what both Tom and Chris said is what psychologists call construct irrelevant variance. So the big idea here is we want differences in grades to reflect real differences in students' capabilities on the domain being assessed by GCSE. And it's important to remember that GCSE is is the exam. It's not the whole of mathematics or the whole of science or the whole of history. It's coming back to this idea, what grade would they have got on this exam on average over the longer term? So we want the differences in students' grades to reflect differences in real achievements in the domain as defined by the GCSE exam. So if, for example, somebody's ethnicity 
fat plays in, then that is construct irrelevant variance. What we should be measuring is their achievement in mathematics or science or history. And so some of the variation, we hope most of it, is caused by differences in mathematics achievement, but some of it is caused by differences in ethnicity. So that one of the big ideas here is to minimize construct irrelevant variation or variance, as statisticians would call it. We want differences in grades as far as possible to be, re to be reflective only of differences in the thing being assessed. And one way you could do that, uh, depending on your mathematical skills, is if you take, for example, if you've got a good set of data, if you take your predicted GCSE grades and the key stage two scores that you've got for your students or some other measure like Fisher Family Trust data or um, CHEM center data, you know, for, from a standardized test of some kind, then plot separate regression lines, or lines of best fit for different groups. Because all of the things being equal, the relationship between pretests or early scores and GCSE grades should be the same for boys and for girls, for students of different, different ethnic groups and so on. And if they're different, then you need to think about why that could be. Now, it could be that you are very confident that in your school, the girls work harder than the boys. So for a given prior attainment of age 11, you might expect girls to be performing higher GCSE than boys. What I'm saying is plotting separate regression lines for separate groups allows you to at least investigate to some extent the possibility of bias. And I would certainly endorse everything that Tom said about not trying to put society right in this process. What we're trying to do here is to, to as far as possible, predict what that child would have got over a long-term average of different choices of the GCSE exam papers that were actually set. So I think that's the, that, that's, that's the really important big idea here, that uh, we have, con you know, we want to minimize construct irrelevant variance. And the other thing is we also want to avoid what is sometimes called construct underrepresentation. So construct underrepresentation is in a sense when the assessment is too small. The first one I mentioned, construct irrelevant variance, is when the assessment is too big. You're assessing things you shouldn't assess. We also have to be aware of the danger of construct underrepresentation. We focus on a child's ability in one aspect of the subject rather than everything that gets covered in the GCSE. So those kinds of things can address the scaling issue or the ranking issue. But the other thing we need to, we need to address is the borderlines because two things can be perfectly correlated but they can be imperfectly calibrated. So we could get all the kids in the right order but if our boundary between eights and nines is not right, then the whole process is brought into, in, 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 into question. The good news is that those kinds of scaling issues can be addressed and probably will be addressed by Ofqual. Um, what, what they can't cope with is inaccuracy. And what we do know is that when, in, in the process that Chris described, when multiple people make judgments about the, the value of a piece of work, then you massively reduce the amount of, of likely error. So as long as we stick to this idea that we need as a, as, a, as, a, as, a fact, as a department team in a secondary school to come to a judgment about where the boundaries are, and we need to achieve consensus on what that student would have done, then I think that you're, you, you'll be in pretty good shape. And then of course, you might want to push, you know, you might think that your value added is greater than the, is, than the, the national average, in which case, you might want to use, um, you, you, you might be com comfortable with a higher um, grade envelope than will be suggested by the transition matrices. Um, but, I, but I think that if, if we think of this process fundamentally as an argumentation, so you might be pushing forward, putting forward the idea that here's the grades, and then think of all the ah, but what if questions that somebody might ask uh, but what if this, uh, but what if that? And so having those internal conversations so that you can head off all the uh, but what if questions can I, I think help you come to a better consensus and a more defensible consensus about the actual grades. But at the end of the day, it's gonna be imperfect, but then GCSE has always been imp imperfect. The good news is that you know, every child takes multiple GCSEs and therefore, um, if, if the error is genuinely random across a school, but even more important, across a student, then the average GCSE with the grades they get will be reasonable. And let's not get too hung about this. My own estimate is that GCSE grades are only accurate probably 20 to 30% of the time. 
So a kid who should get a C will get a C 60, 70% of the time. They get a higher or a lower grade the rest of the time. And we've lived with that. I think teacher assessments can be at least as accurate as examination assessments. The work of um, D. Fowles at the Northern Examination Board in the 1970s showed that teachers' assessments of portfolios of work were actually far more accurate than GCSE assessments through examinations. So um, basically, just be prepared to defend the decisions you make, and I think you'll be fine. Brilliant. Thanks, Dylan. On, on that point of, of the defending those decisions, um, what, what sort of evidence should, uh, should teachers be looking at? Um, uh, you know, we, we've had some uh, questions through uh, in the last couple of weeks saying, you know, should we just be doing this on, on mock exam results? Or, or how do we use a mixture of the formal kind of mock exam results with ongoing classwork? Because the two things are often mark quite differently and appeal to different strengths. So what, how do you balance that use of evidence? Well, I think you have to do it professionally. You have to take a, make a professional judgment. And there's no, there's no point in trying to come up with weights or anything like that. It's just not going to work. What you need to be able to do is to say, we've taken this evidence and we actually attach, you know, we did give our kids mocks and they were pretty authentic mocks. And therefore we think that the mocks are quite important, but we also understand that some kids will have worked hard as a result of the mock examination results they got. And therefore the mock examination might be a less good guide for this student than that student. I think any, any, any evidence that you have is, is, is fair game for this kind of discussion. But I think the really important point is what you made point you made earlier, Tom, it's not, you know, if a kid gets exam phobic, then that should be taken into account in deciding whether that child has, has a potential for further study in that subject. Mm -hmm. It should not be taken into account in this, uh, in this particular exercise. This exercise is trying to predict what grade would that child have got if they took this year's GCSE in the absence of any pandemic or any other factors that were influencing the examination administration procedure. Great, thank you Dylan. Um, I'm sure there'll be some questions so if both Dylan and Chris can can hold on. Um, uh, I know we do have a few questions some of which are quite sort of policy related which I'll answer uh, some of which are, are broader. Uh, Mike uh, from SSAT are you there Mike? Yep I'm here. Yep. Yeah have we got, got a couple of questions and and, um, and then we'll direct them to where, where they need to be directed. Yep, okie doke. So um, one of the first questions was, as we don't have previous results because it's the first cohort of a free school, this particular school is using FFT Asp Aspire to help with their moderation. And they're asking, does this sound a sensible approach? Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, I mean, what, what else are you going to do? If you have better evidence than that, then use it. If you don't, use what you've got. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with Dylan there. Um, just, just what I, what I will add in there, for schools that don't have um, results currently, um, then um, uh, the, the, the formula, the standardisation formula Ofqual are working on, which for most schools will use schools' previous results to some degree, uh, will, uh, th they're obviously very aware of that and, and, and obviously we don't have the formula yet, but just to sort of reassure those, those schools that don't have results, um, you are being considered. Um, by in this process. So, yeah. yeah, and one, one more point. I mean, as, as a researcher, one of the things I've discovered is that anything that actually has a positive correlation with the thing that you're looking at can be used as a useful covariate. So as long as the thing that you're using isn't negatively correlated with GCSEs, then it's information. It's helping you refine and make slightly more accurate your predictions than they would be without that information. Mm -hmm. So any, any measure of achievement, um, it turns out to be useful. Let me, let me give, tell you a story about this. When we had key stage three assessments, if you wanted to predict a key stage four a GCSE grade in science, you might think that the best predictor would be, their GC, would be their key stage three score on the science tasks and tests. But it wasn't. It was the average of English and maths and science. That, that was a better predictor of science GCSE grades than just using the science key stage three test score. Why? because these subject scores intercorrelate quite highly. And by using more evidence, you've got a more reliable assessment, even though they're not perfectly correlated. So basically, you know, any evidence that you've got is probably gonna help you reduce the error in 
your judgments and therefore um, you know, use what you can. Great, thank you, Dylan. Uh, Mike, uh, some more questions. Yeah, okay. Um, a couple of qu similar kinds of questions. Um, so we are on a big upward tra trajectory this year and are projecting higher results than previous years. I'm concerned they will be marked down and also that the school may be open to criticism. Do you have any advice? And on that theme as well, if a school is an improving school and results in previous years do not reflect the current cohorts, how will that be taken into consideration? Okay, um, so I think there's a, a few points to make here. Um, so um, there are three factors that will, that will uh, inform the, um, the national standardization formula. Um, the first is um, expected grade distribution uh, across the country in comparison to, to previous years uh, and the way in which the exams are designed. So does this look um, like we expect? Second is um, the, the prior attainment of your school's cohort. Um, so to answer that second question, if you genuinely have a better cohort, um, as evidenced by their key stage two data, and that's the important caveat to that, um, then absolutely in the standardization formula, that will factor into it. Um, so yes, if you just have a better cohort this year than you have had in previous years, as evidenced by key stage two, that is in the formula. Uh, and then the third factor that will come into the national standardization is, and this is a more controversial one, uh, schools and um, previous results. You can understand why, why Ofqual are doing this. Um, it, you know, uh, most schools don't improve um, you know, or, or decline rapid, in, rapidly in that, uh, in that uh, space of time. Uh, obviously there's an exception there for, for smaller subjects and, and, uh, and smaller schools. Um, Ofqual did consider the, the idea of looking at schools' trajectories and saying where a school shows an upward trajectory, that will be factored into the formula. Uh, but Ofqual's own analysis of the data on that says that that's actually quite an unreliable data set um, and that, um, uh, and therefore are proposing not to use it. Um, so if as a, as a school, you were genuinely predicting better results this year, uh, than in previous years for, for any of those reasons, um, that won't be factored into standardization. That being said, I, I don't think, uh, you know, SSAT's advice is don't let that stop you putting in what you genuinely think students would have achieved had they set exams as normal this summer if it weren't for COVID-19. That's the exercise you're being asked to do. Um, can, and can, I, can I go there? Of course, there um, is. Yeah, so I, and I, think that, 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 I think Tom made a set of really important points. You know, first of all, there's a na there could be a national drift in, in expectations. There could be changes in your intake cohort, which would be reflected in key stage two scores. But I think the really important uh, question uh, behind the point that Mike raised is, we think we are teaching better than we used to, and therefore the relationship between Key Stage 2 and GCSE scores will be different this year from last year. We think we've taught this cohort better than we taught last year's cohort. And my response to that would be, how do you know? So, so you, if you think that the, the value added from Key Stage 2 to Key Stage 4 will be greater this year than it was last year, then you should have some evidence for that. You, you've got that impression somehow. So if you are asked to defend your results, what led to this perception that you have that your kids made more progress than previous cohorts? That evidence might help you um, justify a, 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 a greater value added than would be expected from the national cohort and the transition matrices. Great, thanks, Dylan. Mm. And, and I think there's an opportunity to have a focus on on something other than results at the end of this process. So instead of getting a banner printed to go on the road outside the school that says RP progress eight was this or this many kids got sevens, think about talking, well, this many kids went to do the A-levels that they wanted to do and maybe try and spin the focus of we've got, we the, the reasons for going to school is to teach kids stuff and to get them to the right place in the future the results is a means to do those, to show that you've done those things and to do those things. It's not the reason for school isn't exam results. So I think this is where I 
despite doing a very data heavy job, I end up being a bit of a hippie sometimes. Um, but the reason for school is to learn stuff and we need, we have results to prove that they've learned stuff and we have results to let them get where they've gone. They still learn the stuff no matter what result they get out of this and they can still go where they should go. Um, I understand it's frustrating if, if your, your set of results are massively important to the school, obviously they're part of the narrative and the journey that you need to tell next year's parents that et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's, it's an important thing, but you kind of maybe have to accept that you can't do that this year. And this year will be the same as last year, but you can still get more kids onto A levels than you got last year. Mm. Um, yeah, no, no, thank you, Chris. I think that's really helpful. Uh, I think you did um, just, just on Chris's points there, I think um, absolutely. And, and, and the fundamental, the founding principle behind um, all of Ofqual's um, suggestion and consultation is it's about uh, using this opportunity for students' progression. Where are they going? Also remember, for 2020 at least, well, let's, let's see about 2021 and 2022, but for 2020 at least, CFC are not going to publish any results, either in terms of um, uh, your school level results or your attainment age or anything. Uh, so the only way that, pe that parents are going to find out, you know, what percentage of students uh, got certain grades is if you tell them. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's the only way they're going to know. And so absolutely, this is a really good opportunity uh, in 2020 to, to, as Chris said, talk about a different narrative. Where do students go on to do? What are the other successes you've had as a school? Uh, so completely agree, Chris. Thank you. Uh, Mike, any more questions? Um, just very quickly on this point, um, I've got a couple of questions around how schools could actually, is there a process for schools to justify their decisions? Um, is that, is there an opportunity and has it been published yet? Um, so, so no, uh, it's, on a practical point, uh, in the current consultation that's put out by Ofqual, uh, by well, remember the, the consultation only closed last night, so we're still waiting to hear the, the outcomes of the, of, the, of the consultation. At the moment, the appeals process, um, which is led by centres, by schools, not by candidates, students, uh, the, the appeals process is whether or not the data that you submitted as a as a centre was then used incorrectly or corrupted in some way. What Ofqual has said quite explicitly is there is no opportunity in the current appeals process as they are recommending it for uh, schools to appeal based on some of those decisions. Obviously we don't know the details of that yet and Ofqual do in the consultation acknowledge that there will be some schools and the way Dylan said that um, were genuinely predicting better results this year, a better, a better value added because uh, you know changes to the curriculum, better teaching, uh, different teachers indeed, you know, all of these kind of things. Um, and so um, they acknowledge that that is the case. And so let's see what comes out of the appeals process. At the moment, there wouldn't be, um, but but we'll wait and see. And of course, the SSOT will keep you fully updated when the results of that consultation come out and we'll pay particular attention to that point around how schools might be able to justify that. Uh, on this point of evidence, I think it's also important to note that, that uh, when you submit your teacher assessment grades in rank order, you won't be asked to provide evidence at that point of the, of the, um, of, of the grades submitted but you are asked to keep the evidence that you have used uh, in formulating that judgment. So a couple of points there from, from where we are with the, the off-call consultation. Okay, Mike. Okay, um, a question that's just come in. Will a higher tier grade four or five be ranked higher than a foundation tier grade four or five? Yeah, so um, I know that I've had quite a few questions about, about the tiers uh, and the tiering. Um, so uh, if I could try and address all of them in one. Um, so I know that some, some schools are saying that they would have um, changed the, the, the tier nearer the time. And that obviously when you put uh, students in, uh, into the exams in February, you might have had more students in the foundation tier, uh, see how they progressed uh, over the spring term and then would have entered them for the higher tier. Um, the simple answer is we don't yet know uh, whether or not you will be able to change tiers um, at this point. Um, 
again in the ethical consultation they make explicit reference to the idea that it will be at the discretion of individual exam boards awarding organizations whether or not they um accept late entries um uh into the the summer exam series in this way uh, if the evidence is there that a student genuinely would, would have been entered uh, late for a particular uh, subject or exam. With that in mind, I think that they will also push that decision to exam boards and say it's at the discretion of the exam board uh, as to whether they allow um, uh, candidates to change tiers um, if there is good evidence that, that they would have changed here. Um, so uh, essentially wait and see, and again we'll let you know as soon as we know, um, in terms of um, how you rank them, uh, again, we don't yet know whether um, they will be looking for one rank across the tiers or a rank for foundation and higher in those subjects that have them. Um, so, uh, again, I'd say at the moment, uh, focus on, on, on that process of, of the, the most likely grade they would have got uh, in that subject. Uh, and then when we get more, more detail about that, you can add that level of detail in. Yeah, but the, thing, the thing to remember here, I think, is that the awards are made by the examining bodies, but they have to do so within a framework provided by Ofqual. So it's, it's actually p p possible that different exam boards could make quite different decisions about these kinds of things. And we, it's, the exam boards actually have a lot of discretion because most of the things that they need to decide haven't been envisaged and therefore aren't included in the regulations that govern their behaviour. Absolutely. Uh, and I think on, on that point, uh, Dylan, uh, one, one thing that we were pressing for, and, and we, um, you know, we sit in the advisory group of, of, of the large um, uh, awarding organisations, uh, we were pushing for a, a fairly standardised process in terms of, of what the submission looks like. Um, I, I don't think that will happen. I think the exam board submission might look slightly different. So again, um, uh, just an, an extra challenge to think about in the next month and of course we, we will have the detail of that before the 1st of June submission date but um, worth bearing in mind that different exam boards might be asking for, for the data in slightly different ways it, it's not it's not it's certainly not one portal anyway but yeah thanks Mike Any, anything else um, just one final question um, there's a lot of this information revolves around GCSEs. Is there any difference that you know of about how A levels will be standardised? No, no. So this this process. Um, so I'll, I'll say a few things here. Um, this process um, applies to uh, all uh, GCE. So uh, so GCSE, AS, and A level. It's the same process. Um, uh, in terms of exams that don't fall uh, within that, uh, particularly vocational exams and BTECs, the, the off-core consultation is currently live around that. Essentially, for most qualifications that you're likely to be offering as SSAT members, i.e. schools, um, it will look very, very similar uh, to, uh, to, to the GCSE um, and will be the teacher assessment. The, the, slight, um, the slight caveat to that is, um, of course, vocational qualifications differ far more greatly uh, than, than GCSEs uh, and A-levels uh, in terms of the, the type of assessment that, that's asked for. So where there are assessments where a lot of grades have already been submitted as, uh, through, through coursework uh, or, or non-exam assessment, um, it might be that exam boards use a, uh, a calculated grade rather than a teacher assess grade uh, to, to, to base the final decision on. Again, as Dylan said, that, that, that will be almost certainly at the discretion of individual exam boards for individual qualifications, depending on the nature of that qualification. Um, but, but generally for most, uh, for, for most non-GCSE, uh, non A level qualifications that schools are likely to be offering, it will look like a very similar process. Um, so, although we don't have the, 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 the details of that, of, of that yet, um, certainly it might be worth your, your teachers of those vocational subjects, your, your BTECs, you know, starting to think about what grade they think is most likely those students would have got, if not quite as formally <clears throat> as your GCSE and, and A level teachers. Uh, the other question I know we've had just around this, um, 
which I saw earlier was was a question around the, the ranking um, of, of students. Remember, um, you need to rank um, all candidates for that subject, regardless of their year group. So if you have younger years, if you have older years, if you have private candidates, they all go into one rank. Um, and that's per qualification. So where you might have um, in your school a particular department or subject, but actually there were two separate qualifications that you had students centred for, it's one rank for each of those. Um, so, so do bear that in mind, that as well as at the same time, uh, perhaps getting all of your year 11 teaching staff together, for example, if you've got uh, teachers involved in, in year 12 research, uh, or if you have, uh, if you've got early entries for year 10s, you need to include them all in the same rank. Uh, yeah. There's another question that I saw floating past, which I, think, which I think raises some very important issues that schools need to be aware of. And that is with regard to the freedom of information. Yeah. So uniquely this year, schools will have evidence, will have documentation that directly um, causes students to get particular grades at GCSE. And therefore, there'll be, you know, previously the Freedom of Information request to a, a, about a GCSE grade might have gone to the exam board. Now it'll come to the school. Yeah. So I think schools need to think very carefully about what data they retain. So obviously you need to retain the data. The boards have said that they want this. But, you know, it's important to remember that none of the data processing regulations require you to retain the legislation, uh, documentation for, forever. What it does require you to do is to disclose it if you keep it. So I think schools need to think very carefully about uh, mechanisms for getting rid of any of the documentation that is produced through the ranking procedures that Chris mentioned. Because if you've got them, they are discoverable. If you haven't got them, they aren't. So I think schools need to think very carefully about, you know, how you're gonna make sure that there aren't emails between members of a maths department about a particular grade that might be potentially um, a subject of a freedom of information request. If you fail to comply with that, then you're in trouble. Yeah, thanks Dylan. And we, we touched on this in the, last, in the last policy update for uh, people that were there then, uh, talking about the fact that just, just a reminder, um, you absolutely must not disclose um, the, your teacher assess grades or the rank order um, uh, until the results are published in August. At that point at the moment, uh, individual students and families can make, as Dylan said, an FOI request for that data. Um, and, and it's something that we're looking at and we'll provide further advice about. And maybe actually one of these Thursday policy updates uh, will look specifically at that issue uh, around the rules around data regulation. If that would be helpful to members, please do let me know either via the chat uh, or, or my email. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the things that, that I always make very clear every single time we have one of one of the meetings we have is the meeting happens in the meeting it doesn't happen it doesn't spread it doesn't turn into a chain of emails we don't leave documents around the meeting is the meeting and then it's done it might be split into four chunks but the meeting happens in the meeting and when we leave the meeting at the end of it we unanimously agree on this ranking we we might have individual agreements but collectively the wall we present is we own this we have agreed that this is the ranking that's it i re i don't think it would be helpful at all for uh, de these debates to be ongoing throughout the rest of time for well i said that kid was better than that and i said this kid was better than that and it's not it wasn't me that knocked your grade down it was mr so and so um i think all those things are really damaging and i think it does take it is a certain type of professionalism to be able to just walk away and go right i'm not overly happy i'm not entirely happy with every single place but as a pitcher i'm happy with that piece of work and just let it go um and i think that is really important particularly if you're talking of uh schools who have got six forms and these kids are going to come back um i think there is the potential for a huge amount of upset that doesn't need to be there as long as we focus on the right things yeah thanks chris and i think um we wouldn't we talk about this and uh perhaps it is important to mention that that for those meetings, when, as you said, those online meetings where you sit down and you go, go through uh, name by name each, each individual, um, agreeing a set of ground rules around that as well, um, so that everyone feels confident, uh, uh, you know, having those professional discussions, you know, so 
uh, you know, make as a curriculum leader or as a head of department, um, you know, you you are um, empowering, for example, the NQT who might have only been teaching for you know really two terms before before lockdown happened to be able to have that professional dialogue with perhaps a member of the senior team who who still has a teaching timetable. Uh, so I think you know again, and, and on this on this chat with most of you. I know as senior leaders or head teachers thinking about your role in, in making sure that those meetings happen in the most professional um, uh, uh, and positive way possible is important. Uh, Mike, have we got any further questions? Uh, just a, a comment, which I think um, given looking at a few of the um, chat messages would be is this something that we could as a society that we could support um, our members with so to be able to give them more information and guidance on the freedom of information and subject access requests yeah i, I will we'll pick that up when mike can do something around that yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay one question should we include early in entry year 10 or withdraw and enter next year um, look, this is a decision um, for, for you as schools. Um, at the moment, um, again, without seeing the, the outcomes or, or the, the response to the off call consultation, the current proposals are that um, you can enter any students uh, who are currently entered um, uh, for the summer series, uh, including year 10s and year 9s, um, but their, their results will not count in the 2021 and 2022 uh, performance tables respectively. Um, so, uh, you know, that does imply that at the moment governments are, are assuming that they are going to publish performance tables in 2021 and 2022, hence the reference to that. Um, whether or not that happens remains to be seen, as you know, you know SSAT will be, be arguing that, um, the, 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 uh, not publishing this, this year should be extended at least to next year. Um, Essentially, it's up to you as a school. Um, uh, you know, our, our first guiding principle for SSAT uh, that, I, that I started this session with was it, it should be about the students and about their progression. Um, of course, your performance matters to you as, as senior leaders and will matter to your governors and trustees and, and to your school community. We, we know that. Uh, and so these are tough leadership decisions to make. Um, essentially, um, you have... Um, three options ahead of you. If we take year 10 early entry to make it easier, uh, you can enter them for exams this summer, sorry, uh, enter them for assessment this summer in the teacher assessed way that we've been talking about. Um, they will get the GCSEs, um, but they will not count if performance tables are, are published next year. You can delay it till the autumn series, um, and we don't yet know whether they will count in the, in the performance tables. My gut feeling is they almost certainly will. Um, but of course, that might have timetabling and curriculum um, issues and might to some degree disadvantage them uh, if they are then sitting the exams, um, having not been formally taught since March. And obviously, we don't know when when all students uh, in all areas will go back to school yet. Uh, or the third option is, is to, to sit the exams uh, in the summer of 2021. So there are the kind of three options that are available to you. Um, and it will be a matter for you as, as school leaders and governors to decide what's best for your, your school community and your students. But what I would say is I would urge you to put the, the, the needs and the interests of your students first, in, um, as always, and I know that you all, all agree with that. Uh, Mike, any other comments? Um, just going through them now. Um... So is the autumn series open to all students who are entered or just those whose grade centres contested their grades? No, uh, so the autumn series is, is open to all students uh, who are entered for the summer exams, but only those students entered for the summer exams. So again, uh, you can't put additional students in. They have to be ones that were already entered. And it, it looks like lots of people are actually answering lots of the questions as well uh, between themselves, which is really good. So uh, it's worth encouraging everyone to have a look at the chat. Great, thank you. Um, uh, I'll go to, to Chris first, then Dylan for any final words. So um, Chris, have you got any final words, tips, recommendations for people uh, as they start this process next month? Um, 
I, I don't think anything we haven't already discussed. I think just uh, just try and keep those principles of, uh, I think, start by acknowledging that it's a tough, weird thing. Um, I think I'm, I've said multiple times to people, I'm, I'm glad I don't have to do it. Um, acknowledge that, accept, be open that it's going to be a difficult thing. Therefore, people will get upset. People will get emotional. It is difficult. Don't try and pretend it's not. Um, but acknowledge that and do it in good faith. And then, like I said, agree that that list as a group and agree that although you're not happy with every single position of the kids you've personally taught within that as a subject teacher, it's better than doing nothing and just accept that you've done the best you can collectively and then focus on, on the next step. So is, is the next step that you do this ranking and then you make it clear to the kids that if you, if, if what the result of the ranking and the adjustment is you can't your sixth form kick off, then here's a letter of recommendation or here's this email. And is there a rotor of which SLT are going to be available on results day? All those normal things you do, but I think they're going to be amplified. Um, so I think, can you be extra flexible in your A levels? To can you let kids start an extra A level? Can you let kids, uh, whatever? Can you make adjustments to try and and rectify? Just accept that, like like Dylan said, the results are never perfect anyway. But if they're going to be wronger than they normally are, can we, what adjustments can we make to make it fair in the long run? So that I think that it's important that the focus isn't right. That kid should have got a seven and I'm outraged. They didn't get a seven. The outrage should be that kid should have done a level history and they're now not allowed to do a level history. That's the injustice. The injustice isn't the number on their CV because maybe this is, again, I don't put my GCSEs on my CV at all. I, I don't even put my A levels on my CV anymore. Um, because I'm a grown up with 10 years of career of, of career um, or two careers, but 10 years of two careers. So I think we need to acknowledge that the important thing is that they go to do the right things, not that the number's perfect. The number needs to be good to let them do the thing, but can you try and think of other ways? And I think that's a healthy thing to do of, right. We're not happy with the process. We're not happy that the process had to happen. Um, but use that productively to try and try and fi fix the next steps rather than just being angry about the fact that we had to do this process. Thanks, Chris. And I, I think in terms of that destination stuff, absolutely. And I just uh, will remind people, as I, as I said previously, that, um, uh, it, you know, the, these, uh, these particularly for the year, year 13s, um, universities are going to be desperate to have them, quite frankly, this year. Uh, there are just less, um, less 18-year-olds uh, this year. Uh, and, um, and, of course, we know that... that, that universities are suffering from not having international students um, coming as well. so um, uh, universities will be, will be very desperate to have them that's not to say that's not to make it make light of it but um, it is worth bearing in mind thank you um, Dylan any final words well just to echo what Chris said I've been banging on about the unreliability of GCSEs for about 20 years now and I haven't been doing that to undermine faith in GCSEs I've been doing it so that people don't place too much weight on the results of those examinations. Because when you realize that the exams aren't perfect, my experience is people take other sources of evidence into account. But my plea is, is, is like Chris's, don't have hard benchmarks for choosing from GCSE whether students go to do A-levels in particular subjects, and for universities, don't get hung up about particular A-level grades because they're actually not particularly reliable as predictors of future performance. And I say that as somebody who got a third class degree, so I wouldn't say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> um, in terms of the things we've been talking about today, I think that just, you know, just keeping your eye on the, what you should be doing. For each student, what we're trying to do is to say, how would that student do on an average day, on an average GCSE exam for this subject? So, so if, we, if you're just trying to think of that, how would this student do on an average day, not a particularly good day or a particularly bad day, but on an average day, and on, that, on, on an average GCSE. So across all the GCSE papers you've seen for that syllabus, not the one that would suit them best, but the, or the one that would suit them least, but on an average GCSE, how would they do? And as long as you keep your eye on that, I think most of the decisions you're gonna be, gonna be making are gonna be pretty defensive. Brilliant, thank you very much um, to Chris and Dylan, and thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Um,
just before you wrap up, could I just ask you, there's been a, f a couple of questions around something that's come up a number of times, but I, I don't think I spotted them in time, so I apologise for that. But could you give any more information about moderation, about whether it's done per subject or per centre, um, please, because a few people have asked about it. The, the standardisation? Well, the moderation. So, so the standardisation, uh, at a national level will be done uh, per qualification. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you uh, again to Dylan, Chris, uh, and to Mike for, uh, for fielding those questions. Um, uh, as I said um, in my email earlier, we will be doing a regular policy updates at 4 p.m. every Thursday um, throughout May. Some will be shorter or longer depending on uh, the news that has come out, but please do continue to email me up with any suggestions of, of topics that you would like covered and we'll try and bring in the right people um, to cover those. Um, if, uh, if you are interested, um, then I also sent around a link to, to Chris's blog um, around this um, and a link to uh, Dylan's work on formative assessment, particularly um, the uh, embedding formative assessment two-year programme. Uh, equally, if um, you found this useful and you'd like me to talk to either any groups in your school, your groups of governors, your groups of trustees, uh, or groups of your senior team, and um, that's something I'm, I'm very happy to do. Uh, and again, there were details in the email earlier. Um, but thank you all. Um, have a, a good afternoon. Uh, have a good weekend when it comes and stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you.